Hi everyone, my name is Elaine, and today I'm going to be both summarizing and reviewing the 33rd novel in Terry Pratchett's Discworld series, Going Postal, starting with the summary. The One Month Prologue. A Klaxman is killed while making repairs. Chapter 1. The Angel. Moise von Lipvig, aka Alfred Spangler, is in prison. He is going to be hung in the morning. Alfred is hung and dies. Moist awakens in the patrician's office. The patrician acts as an angel, offering Moist the chance at redemption in the form of employment. Moist is offered the job of Postmaster General of the Ankmore Pork Post Office. He will be paid to maintain post office property, etc. Moist agrees. He wants to live. The con artist tries to get back in the game, but is returned to Ankmore Pork by his parole officer, a golem. Chapter 2. The Post Office Moist reports for duty. He finds the post office in disarray, the floor covered in pigeon droppings, etc. Moist meets Mr. Grote, an older man but junior postman, and one of the two employees in the post office's service. The office hasn't been open for 20 years. Moist meets apprentice postman Stanley, who is obsessed with pins. Grote begins telling Moist about the post office's golden days. They had counters made of rare wood, etc. After cleaning up a little, Mr. Pump, the golem, informs Moist that the mounds aren't all pigeon dung. They're comprised largely of old letters. Moist discovers that the post office is overrun with undelivered mail, and that no one is interested in the post now that they have the clacks. Stanley and Mr. Grote talk about something whispering to them. Chapter 3. Our own hand, or none. Moist delivers one of the letters. Moist meets Adora Bell Dearheart, who works at the Gollum Trust. He learns to treat Mr. Pump normally. He also learns that the previous postmasters didn't last very long. The members of the Grand Trunk Company's board are brought before the patrician. They are accused of embezzlement, conspiring to keep rates high and competition non-existent, etc. Furthermore, since they acquired the Grand Trunk at a fraction of its value, breakdowns are increasing, the speed of messages has slowed down, and the cost to customers has risen. That's on pages 90 to 91. In addition, all new opposing clack companies have failed. Veninari announces that he is reopening the post office as planned. The board members think it's foolish. The patrician orders an investigation. Chapter 4. A Sign Moist discovers that his four predecessors died in five weeks, mostly in unusual circumstances. Moist becomes Stanley's friend after giving him a rare pin. Moist realizes he acquired his job because he's expendable and vows to get to the bottom of the untimely deaths. Moist, Mr. Grote, and Mr. Pump retrieve the post office's stolen metal sign letters from a barbershop. The letters are put back in their proper place. Moist delivery had reunited two old sweethearts. They're getting married in a few days and want the post to deliver the wedding invitations, putting the post back in business. A woman warns of the post office's curse. It lives under the floor and makes you mad. Moist promotes Grote to probationary senior postman. Chapter 5. Lost in the Post Horace Fry, a board member for the Grand Trunk Company, knows he is being spied on. He seeks the support of Mr. Gilt, another board member, who knows they brought the Grand Trunk with its own money. Horace Fry gives Gilt a journal with all their transactions for safekeeping. Moist notices that there's a clax tower on the post office's roof. Moist also realizes that the undelivered letters are alive when they begin whispering to him. He realizes that they want to be read. Moist promotes Grote to senior postman. The mail asks Moist to deliver it. Moist agrees. Chapter 6. Little Pictures Moist promotes Grote to postal inspector. Moist and several volunteers, retired postal workers, begin delivering mail and getting the post office back in order. After learning about stamps from Grote, Moist considers how to use them to the post office's benefit. Moist hires some golems. The office needs the extra hands. Moist begins designing stamps. Moist puts the golems to work. Moist asks Miss Dearheart out on a date. She declines. Chapter 7. Tomb of Words Moist arranges for the printing of his stamps. Moist discovers that sometimes problems arise when delivering extremely old letters. Moist vows to bring the post office back to its former glory. Moist pays a visit to Pelk, a wizard at the university. Pelk explains that when the post office started accumulating letters, it was storing words. What was being created was a javesa, a tomb of living words. All words have some power. We feel it instinctively. Some, like magical spells and the true names of the god, have a great deal. They must be treated with respect. When there is a critical mass of them, they change the nature of the universe. Enough words crammed together can affect time and space. Until a letter is read, it's not complete. They will try anything to be delivered. That's on pages 225 to 227. This explains the whispers, etc. The Times publishes an article about the post office's promises, such as they'll deliver anywhere in the world. The queue forms outside the post office. Mr. Horsefry is dead. The first sets of stamps are delivered to the post office. The post office receives new letters and continues to deliver others. Since the clacks are down, Moist rents a horse so he can ride to Stolat with undelivered messages at a fraction of the clacks' price. Moist asks Miss Deerheart out on a date. She accepts. Chapter 7a. Post Haste. Moist arrives in Stolat and delivers the mail. He'll be returning to Inkmore Pork later that day. Upon his return, Moist discovers that business is booming. The post office has taken on new employees and more people want jobs because of what was written in the Times Lunchtime Edition. Moist promotes Stanley to head of stamps. Moist receives a letter from the smoking new. It reads, the Pseudopolis clax line will break down at 9 a.m. tomorrow. That's on page 267. Mr. Gilt asks his associate, Mr. Greel, to set the post office on fire. Chapter 9. Bonfire 
Moist negotiates with the Upright brothers to transport his mail to distant lands on their coaches. He finally gets them to agree to help. Jim says the smoking new or some kind of outlaw signalers or something, something to do with the overhead. That's on 280. While out on their date, Miss Deerheart warns Moist that the Grand Trunk Company is going to come for him. The company is in trouble and he's competition. Miss Deerheart explains that her father, Robert Deerheart, helped design the clacks and build the trunk. He was chairman of the original company, then Gilt and his men stole it from them by buying up the mortgages and controlling banks and moving numbers around. That's on 293. She also reveals that she believes her brother John was killed for attempting to start a company to rival the trunk. Stanley hears a scream. Mr. Greel lights the post office on fire. Chapter 10, The Burning of Words. Moist rescues Stanley and Mr. Grote from the fire before going back in to rescue the post office cat, Tittles. He encounters Mr. Greel, who had attacked and severely wounded Mr. Grote earlier. Moist stabs him with a makeshift stake. Moist fights Greel and manages to kill the banshee. The golems rescue Moist and Tittles from the fire. The fire is extinguished. There is an explosion. The eldest golem perishes. Most of the post office burns down. Moist knows guilt was behind it and Grote had been attacked because he had been wearing his postmaster's hat. Moist fails to put the post office back in good working order and bankrupt Breacher Guilt. The smoking knew was right. The clax to Pseudopolis has gone down. Moist decides to take advantage of this by reducing the rate of mail delivered to Pseudopolis. The post carries on. Chapter 11, Mission Statement. Moist pretends some of the gods spoke to him and retrieves the $150,000 he stole in another life. He intends to use most of the money to rebuild the post office. The rest will be donated to the temples of the gods who helped him. Grote is released from the hospital. The Trunks board members meet. They realize that they're going to have to put some money into the clacks or the post office, which is far more dependable, will put them out of business. They are loath to do so, but Gilt convinces them to embezzle and otherwise steal more money to fund their venture. He prepares to tell the times of the Trunks' plan to put hundreds of thousands of dollars into their company to turn the way it is run around. A gross exaggeration. The post office begins to rebuild. After reading the paper, Moist discovers what Gilt is up to. The trunk's too big to fail. Too many investors. He'll get more money, keep the system going just this side of a disaster, then let it collapse. Buy it up, then buy a- another company. Maybe at a knockdown price? That's on 371. Moist intends to head to the Times. He plans on wiping the smile off Gilt's face by attempting the impossible. Chapter 12, The Woodpecker. The Times Prince Moist Challenge. The Post can deliver a message from Ink Morpork to Genua faster than the Clax. The Trunks board members are informed that their towers are being sabotaged. Moist informs Miss Deerheart that he is the reason she lost her old job at the bank. He tells her all about his past life. She advises him to make it up to the post office's roof. Moist finally makes it onto the post office's roof and meets the Smoking New. They used to work with Miss Deerheart's brother on the Mark II Tower. The Smoking News members are crackers because they can crack the system. They can send messages for free, etc. They have been sabotaging the trunk, but the company's policy changes are going to make it hard for them to do anything else. Even so, the group decides to try and help Moist win the upcoming race by unleashing the Woodpecker, which may be able to knock out every tower. Moist knows this will bring the trunk down. Chapter 13, The Edge of the Envelope. Moist and Mr. Gilt wager $100,000 on the outcome of the race. The race commences. Moist speaks with the smoking new. He convinces them not to use the woodpecker to bring the clax down. Instead, they're going to take Gilt out with a message. The group sends the message via clax. Moist's message is delivered to the Ankmore Porkians waiting to see who won the race. It reads, Who will listen to the dead? We who died so that words could fly demand justice now. These are the crimes of the board of the Grand Trunk. Theft, embezzlement, breach of trust, corporate murder. That's on 443. Chapter 14, Deliverance. There is an uproar. The reader couldn't finish the message. Veninari calls for silence. The messenger continues reading and explains that the board gained control of the trunk via a ruse known as the double lever, in the main using money entrusted to them by clients who did not suspect. That's on 448. The patrician orders an investigation of the board and the companies they own. Veninari closes the grand trunk until further notice and all of the board members, save guilt, who had disappeared are arrested. Veninari requests that Moist become administrator of the grand trunk. Moist reluctantly agrees. Epilogue. Some time after. Mr. Gilt is brought before the patrician. He is given the same offer as Moist, but with the royal mint instead of the post office. He doesn't take the offer. The clacks are back up and running. And that's the end of my summary. Now, on to my book review. I wasn't a fan of this novel. First, I thought it strange that this novel had both a chapter 7 and a chapter 7a, but not a chapter 8. Pratchett just skipped ahead to chapter 9. Furthermore, the notes beneath the chapter and its title give away some of what happens. I would have preferred those notes, or headings, whatever you would like to call them, were not included to allow me to be more surprised by the plot's progression. I also felt as though this was a particularly slow Discworld novel, although it picked up at the end, which really helped rescue the plot. Furthermore, it wasn't as funny as a lot of the Discworld novels which came before it. In addition, many of the characters were easy to like, like Moist, the reluctant hero forced into attempting to redeem himself after a life of crime, while others, like Gilt, the lying crook, were not. Some of them were just plain peculiar. Examples would include Groat, who was just a little too obsessed with his job at the Post, and Stanley, who was just a little too obsessed with pins for a large portion of the novel. I mean, pins? Really? I thought Gilt's name was interesting, though. It's a really good play on words, since Gilt means to be covered thinly with gold leaf or gold paint, suggesting that his character isn't as good as 
as it seems, and he lacks the value he portrays. Furthermore, guilt sounds like guilt, which can be short for guilty. Being that he's the main antagonist and to blame for most of the problems described in the novel, I felt as though his name was rather apt. So overall, I gave this book a 3 out of 5 star rating. I definitely wasn't the biggest fan of this one. If the pace had been better and large portions of the plot hadn't been ruined by the description under the chapter and their titles, I definitely think I would have enjoyed it a lot more. And there you have it, my summary and review of Terry Pratchett's Going Postal. What did you think of my review and my summary, and what did you think of this novel if you read it? Let me know down below in the comments. I always like to know what you guys think. And if you like what you saw here today, please smash that like button until it's blue, subscribe, ring that bell so you know what's up, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Bye guys! Hey! Hey! Are you listening? Hey, this is Billy West. I knew you'd recognize my voice, but sometimes you can't because you're watching King's Entertainment Reviews. Now, I would love it, being the professor, if you'd comment, like, and subscribe. You hear that? He knows what he's talking about because he's a smart old bastard. Yeah. All right. Now, get with it.